and I will start screen share after you get a chance to welcome everybody. Okay, that's great. Well, um, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Roger Blood, and um, on behalf of the town's Housing Advisory Board and the Planning Department staff, including uh, our working group led by uh, Joe Viola, I want to welcome all of you uh, to this second uh, community-wide forum, which is an integral part of the town's updated housing production plan now underway. Our thanks, first of all, to those of you who have participated in the first community forum in January, and also to those of you who joined in one of our uh, housing production plan consultants uh, focus groups and or in the um, recent townwide housing survey. And a special welcome to those of you uh, uh, this evening uh, for, uh, for those of you who, where this event is your first contact with the housing production plans community engagement process. Uh, we'll hope you'll find that this, this evening's program uh, is informative and engaging for you. The town undertook the original 2016 housing production plan mainly to secure the state's approval of a plan that would give Brookline uh, greater control over the pace and scale of new housing development under the state's chapter uh, 40B anti-snob zoning law. <clears throat> Many components of that prior plan have been advanced uh, since 2016. Five years ago, the town's affordable housing inventory as counted by the state was only 8.6% and uh, at that time, 367 units short of the state's 10% goal for cities and towns. At our first forum a month ago, we were just a few units short of, of that 10% threshold. Uh, this evening, I'm pleased to uh, share with you uh, that uh, with the recent permitting of uh, two significant new housing projects, one in North Brookline and one in South Brookline, uh, that the town's now state approved housing inventory has passed the 10% by a sizable uh, margin. And so this HPP update uh, is being done for a different reason. Uh, than our original five-year plan. Here in 2022, uh, we, we do still want to understand what are Brookline's greatest housing needs, uh, even while the overall need seems almost endless, limitless. Uh, we still need to understand the impediments to fulfilling those most urgent needs, uh, along with the best strategies uh, for moving forward. Uh, and beginning with this evening's forum, and with your help, um, we want to understand where and how new affordable housing can be created that is inclusive and that best fulfills our community's vision uh, for itself over the coming decade and beyond. With this brief intro introduction, then, I'll turn uh, the program over to Judy Barrett, who's leading our housing production plan consulting team. Uh, Judy will be summarizing first uh, for you their progress to date. Uh, followed by a conversation with you and seeking uh, your guidance regarding uh, this next and most uh, very important phase of the housing production work. Judy? Thank you, Roger. So I'm going to start to screen share the presentation. So good evening, everyone. As Roger said, I'm Judy Barrett, and um, I'm fortunate to be joined by other consultants on this team, uh, all of whom um, I think have brought tremendous dimension and value to the work for um, Brookline. So on this slide, we simply list on the source of assistance to us since we started in mid-October, uh, representatives of the Housing Advisory Board and other town officials uh, on the team uh, is uh, my, myself, Judy Barrett from Barrett Planning Group and my colleagues, uh, two, three of whom are on this meeting tonight, um, Catherine, Alexis and Greg. Um, Daphne Politis from Community Circle, who you'll hear quite a bit from this evening, uh, is really our community engagement lead for this project. And then of course we have um, two consultants from Dodson and Flinker, who you'll also hear from quite a bit this evening. Um, and then Language Connections is available to provide um, interpretation and translation support for this project. And Daphne, I think you might want to address this slide. So if anyone would like to receive interpretation in Cantonese, and Terry, if you would please uh, interpret that for me, you need to uh, follow the, the, these directions. So if, Catherine, if you can bring Terry back. 
so that he may address the, the large group. We offered interpretive uh, Sorry. services in four languages and we had uh, takers uh, for only for Cantonese. So that's why we are offering that. So, Terry, are you back? Sorry, we're just pausing for a moment so we can get Terry, our interpreter, into the room to speak to the large group. In the meantime, if whoever is needing the services could please um, see this arrow, the yellow arrow, and you need to just click on that globe and then choose Cantonese. So I think rather than wait to bring Terry back and then put him back in the room again, we'll, we'll simply continue and we'll yes. watch for anyone who requests assistance. Yes. If, if you need assistance, please write help in the, in the chat. Right. So just a few kind of uh, ground rules, if you will. Um, please try to keep your microphone uh, on mute unless someone asks you to, to speak. There's just a lot of people in the meeting and we have a tremendous amount to cover tonight, more than at the first meeting. So we appreciate everybody's cooperation. Um, you'll be staying together tonight for the whole meeting. We're not going to do breakout groups. So any questions that are asked will be presented to everyone who's participating. Um, you'll have lots of opportunities to make comments in the chat. And as time permits, we'll also take um, you know, spoken responses as well. If you have any questions during the presentation, please write them in the chat. We'll save the questions, we'll respond in writing if necessary after the meeting, but clearly we'll try to respond during the meeting uh, as I think we tried to do at the first meeting in January. So just basic kind of overview of the meeting. So the agenda for tonight is I wanna do a kind of quick review of the housing production plan update. I'm not going to go over all the background that I went through on January 26th, um, but I'll answer questions if necessary. Uh, we mainly want to give you a progress report on what's happened with community participation, which has been extensive. And uh, so I'm going to cover the kind of overview of the plan and where we are at this point. And then Daphne is going to go through the community participation process uh, that we have done so far. Um, part two of the meeting is where the representatives of Dodson and Flinker will be speaking to you about uh, opportunities and challenges for accommodating affordable housing um, in Brookline and how we can sort of identify areas perhaps for further study. So we are gonna do a couple of polls and we're gonna try to keep this short. Um, but the first, we're just curious to know of the folks in the room, um, how many of you attended the January 26th um, meeting? So Catherine, if you can activate that poll, that would be great. Or Alexis, whoever's going to do it. There we go. So. Um, that's the age one. So we'll ask that, we'll ask that one anyway. <laughs> uh, so how old are you? Um, under 18, 18 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, uh, 50 to 64, or 65 to 79, or 80 and over. Judy, there are four uh, questions in this poll. So um, all four ah, of those are listed right. in this poll. Right. So the second question is, how long have you lived in Brookline? And there's options for that. And then third is, uh, have you ever lived or do you currently live in affordable housing? And then the last question, which I read first, was, were you present for the January 26th meeting? So Catherine, you can let me know when it looks like everybody has responded. The responses are still coming in pretty quick. I understand. That's fine. All right, they're slowing down. So since you're in control of these, do you mind providing the kind of summary of what the responses were? Sure, so I'm gonna end the poll now because it looks like we've got just about everybody. Great, thank you. And I'm sharing the results. Everybody should be able to see this. So it looks like, um, the majority in the meeting today are um, either between 50 and 64 or 65 and 79. Um, and the majority have, well, 
almost 50% have lived in Brookline for more than 20 years. Um, the next uh, most popular answer is 11 to 20 years. Right. Um, it looks like 10% of our respondents uh, currently live in affordable housing. Um, 7% have lived in affordable housing in the past and 83% have not. Um, and 65% of tonight's attendees were at the January 26th public forum. Okay, super. Thank you, everyone. That's helpful. Um, I was especially uh, interested to know how many people may have not have been there on January 26th so that I kind of know where perhaps to fill in some information that we went over in more detail that evening. So I think we can take the poll down. There we go. So Sorry, Judy, one second. There's someone asking, how do we define affordable housing? So just to- I'm gonna to get to that. Thank you. So a housing production plan is a, uh, it's a state recognized and regulated plan to create um, more housing in a community focus, focusing mainly on housing for lower moderate income households. Um, it is a strategy to stay above the 10% uh, minimum under chapter 40B uh, to get there and, and to stay there, which you know, for a town like Brookline, which has made tremendous progress since the last plan in 2016, the staying there is, is very important um, because the town has worked so hard to get there. Uh, it's a strategy to address housing needs um, of hey. people living in the community or, you know, who perhaps work for local businesses or people with children uh, and people looking for a home or an apartment. And if everyone can try to make sure you're on mute, that will be appreciated. Thank you. Um, and it's finally a plan to prevent housing discrimination uh, in public programs and services and provide for equity in the distribution of housing throughout uh, a community. There are three components to a housing plan. The first part um, and the second part are kind of really where we're focusing at this point. Um, the first part is sort of a demographic overview, a pretty intensive one of the town. We are expecting a significant release of new data in, on March 17th. So uh, some of the data sets that we're really focusing on, um, we're not actually presenting yet because we don't have them, but we'll have them soon. So we've been working with a previous data set that's been available you know, for a year now. Uh, it looks at your housing stock, what's it comprised of, um, how expensive is it, what is the market doing, uh, what's happening with affordable housing production, what are the barriers and uh, opportunities to, to create more housing, and what is local capacity, and by that I mean what is the town staff capacity, what is its financial capacity, what is the capacity of for-profit and non-profit developers, how, how can you, what, what are the things that you can rely on to kind of bring to the table to create uh, affordable housing to meet local needs. The housing goals in a housing production plan are really of two types. One is sort of what kind of housing do you need and want to see in new development? And the other is really a numerical target that was set years ago uh, by the housing production plan regulation. And I'll explain that more in a minute. Um, implementation strategies, which we're not at yet, but we're moving toward that. Um, the state requires communities to identify certain kinds of strategies. Um, some involve kind of looking at your zoning and potential zoning changes that could make affordable housing development easier to do without reliance on Chapter 40B. Um, some of it is involved looking at specific sites or areas in the community where more affordable housing would make sense, regardless of the permitting tool that you use to create it. Uh, what kind of development do you want to see again? And what sort of opportunities are there to work with regional organizations um, or neighboring communities perhaps to uh, explore affordable housing development. So why is Brookline working on this plan? Uh, first of all, the town is extremely close to the 10% minimum and may have actually exceeded it in the last couple of weeks with the um, release of some building permits for a project that's under construction, actually two. Um, so the question now is, well, what next? I mean, if you don't actually have to worry about the 10% minimum so much, what, what, do you, what do you do as a community? Um, Brookline fortunately has a wonderful history of supporting affordable housing development, and not only because of chapter 40B, but because the town has a, a sense of, of duty and commitment, which is, is laudable. And it's one of the reasons the town has done so well 
implementing the previous housing production plan. Um, another consideration is that, as I think you all know, it's a, a town with a high cost market. And so Brookline is a difficult place to create affordability. Um, the other thing that the town's asked us is, you know, what are the strategies or approaches that might work and, and how can affordable housing development be accommodated and where? So people often ask, as someone did earlier, what is affordable housing? Well, under Chapter 40B, it has a very specific meeting, as it does under the town's inclusionary zoning ordinance, but the meetings are a little bit different. Under Chapter 40B, um, the, um, the, uh, an affordable unit is a unit that counts toward what the statute calls a 10% minimum. It is affordable to households with income at or below 80% of the median for the Boston metro area in which you're located. Um, and it's safe and suitable and it's protected by a deed restriction so that it remains affordable over time. So there are different income limits, but essentially what it's saying is for the median household income for your metro area, it has to be affordable to households whose income is no more than 80% of that number um, adjusted for household size. Brookline's inclusionary zoning rec recognizes that same 80% standard for rental units. For home ownership units, the affordability can slide up to 120% of AMI, so it goes over the limit for Chapter 40B. Therefore, those units are not actually eligible for the subsidized housing inventory, but they address a local need that the town has been conscious of for a very long time. And that's why its own zoning has kind of a couple of different thresholds or definitions for income. So the goals for the housing production plan, as I mentioned earlier, there are two types. One is sort of quantitative. Um, and then the other is what I call qualitative. And the quanti quantitative ones are set by the state. They're a, a, a numerical target that's based on a, a, a ratio to your total housing inventory. And Brookline has been certified before under its housing plan uh, that was done in 2016. So the town has had success with this. So it's either 131 units uh, for one year or 262 for two years. Uh, must be created in a single calendar year in order to qualify for the certification. What that means is that the Board of Appeals has sort of a temporary break from approving uh, new affordable units if the town has met that certification. The certification is a reward for production. Qualitative, um, and which are the things we really kind of focus on the most in these plans, is what kind of housing is needed to address uh, the needs in the community. Um, and then what types of housing are we thinking about? Home ownership or rental or congregate or housing for people with special needs and so forth. And also what is feasible in your market. So those are the kind of the considerations that we have to think about in the goals for the plan. We have a specific role in this project and it's very different from yours and the town officials and others who are ultimately going to decide what to do with the plan. We've been asked to study how more affordable housing can be created in Brookline, to identify opportunities and barriers to meet needs and to provide recommendations. It is up to the town to decide whether to accept those recommendations, how it will address them, if at all, and when. So you get to make those policy choices. Our job is to provide technical and professional consultation um, in a planning framework that we've done in you know, literally scores of other communities in Massachusetts. And so this, uh, this approach is, is not uh, new. You know, it's actually been done in Brookline before uh, and you folks will get to decide what you want to do with it. So Daphne, I think you take over from here. Thank you, Judy. So as Judy said, um, this approach has been applied in multiple multiple, multiple uh, communities, and especially Judy has extensive experience in housing. However, it's very important that policy decisions be informed by people living in a community, people wanting to experience different kinds of uh, housing options and help us to understand what Brookline wants and needs. And that's why we de de devised this uh, approach. And Basically, the, the community participation process so far, because this is just one phase, has uh, been three different uh, types of forums. One has been interviews and focus groups. The second was the public forum in January, and the third was an online survey. So the interview process 
began in mid-October and um, we kind of put a pause on it in the end of January. Interviewed 137 Brookline residents, advocates and stakeholders. And this, uh, what emerged from this were several key themes. Basically uh, a, a pretty dire description of housing conditions, especially with regard to public housing significant difficulties searching for and, fi and finding affordable homes, especially deeply affordable rental homes, a lack of home ownership options, a lack of affordable uh, family housing, and a need for uh, po policy changes and leadership that, dis that, makes the takes the decision that addressing these issues is a priority. Next slide, please. So the interview process, um, basically we did a, a broad brush of different kinds of focus areas and interest groups, as well as some affinity groups where we did some more targeted um, outreach. Next slide, please. So what did we hear? There's considerable debate about the locations and housing types, but very few participants actually disagreed with the need for more affordable housing in Brookline. It's been our experience in other communities that there's been more of that. In Brookline, there seemed to be much more agreement about the need for affordable housing. Now, we talk to people a lot about what kind of criteria for, for locating affordable housing. And there were a lot, there was some, a lot of people thought that access to public transportation was critical. But interestingly, most of the residents of public housing that we spoke with said that while they appreciate public transit, it's not critical. So that's something to consider. That there are very few affordable home, home ownership units for families, for renters to buy up or for seniors to downsize in. Rentals are extremely difficult to find for single mothers, for people with disabilities, and also for large families. Mm -hmm. Next. several concerns were also expressed. Some people felt that the town's 2005 comprehensive plan is outdated and should be updated prior to preparing the uh, housing production plan. Some expressed um, a concern related to how will an increased housing development potentially affect economic development and have impact on the town's schools and public facilities and streets and traffic. Will housing growth displace longstanding small businesses that the community so treasures. And there was uh, quite a lot of discussion about contextual design. How can the, this new housing fit into the neighborhood in terms of scale, massing, architectural style? And how will seniors age in the community if there is such a, a, a lack of opportunities and options for them to downsize in? And quite a few people shared with us what they said was a common secret. And that is that a lot of people that live in very large homes are renting out rooms that are illegal, that do pose perhaps some public health and safety issues and concerns, but also some thought it was a way to provide some affordable rental units. And so why not legalize it with a process in place that protects the health and safety? And of course, parking. Parking is an issue in every single community. Is it too much? Not enough? What do we do? Yep. Next slide, please. We spoke to quite a few of Brookline Housing Authority residents. And there was complete consensus regarding the conditions, which are really um, significant, require significant attention. They're deteriorating, uh, maintenance is delayed, the unit sizes are inadequate, there's bad internet, no space for a microwave, no washer dryer allowed in the new units, not allowed to decorate the units, not allowed to personalize them, health issues with regard to rodent and roach infestation and mold, and the need for support for grandparents bringing up their grandchildren as we know COVID-19 disproportionate, disproportionately affected people of color and there were more deaths in that, in that community. 
leaving more grandparents to care for their grandchildren and unit sizes and support are, are inadequate according to people who are experiencing this. Need for multilingual information and help in navigating opportunities, accessing housing options, and especially um, for people who are not computer literate and add to that um, their English proficiency level is not adequate to do that navigation. And they report being isolated, economically segregated and feeling stigmatized. But mostly people felt they were afraid to speak up. And one of the reasons cited was that um, a lot of people prior to being in public housing were homeless and they were afraid that if they speak out, they'll be homeless again. In terms of the size of units, just one more thing, sorry. Judy, sorry, that's okay. sorry. <laughs> the senior, senior units. Um, there are a lot of units that are allocated to seniors. However, as one resident put it to me, she said, can you imagine downsizing life into 300 square feet? Not even your memories can fit in there, let alone your grandchildren coming for a visit. Next slide, please. So when we ask people, some groups of people in Brookline have a more difficult time than others finding housing that meets their needs, not only in terms of affordability, but that meets their needs. Who has a hard time? Consistently, the, these were the responses. People of color, low and moderate income families, large families, single parents, people with mobility challenges, including the elderly, single people, young people, town staff, people working in town, people with limited English proficiency, and almost without family wealth or extraordinarily high income. Next slide. When we asked at the forum in January, I tried to create a picture of image of Brookline and it's very best in terms of accommodating a range of housing needs and hopes. There was agreement around three areas. There are more opportunities that people wanted more opportunities for more diverse population, more support for low income families and provide quality, healthy public housing. However, there was disagreement or rather a range of responses in terms of how to do that. Some felt that density should be increased and multifamily should be allowed throughout the town Others felt that public transit should be expanded to cover all areas of town, therefore opening up the opportunity. And then yet others said increased density only in select locations, mainly along public transit corridors. And this, this very is repeated throughout um, discussions. Next slide, please. What criteria should be considered in the housing plan for locating more affordable housing? Again, public transit sh transit should be available over town, free or cost, make some dedicated bus lanes, expand bus service was one way of people looking at it, uh, making walkable and bikeable areas throughout the town. Uh, several people point out what we, what we uh, mentioned earlier, that the very people who are seeking the affordable housing should tell us what their needs are and whether or not, you know, what the priorities are in terms of the criteria. Access to internet, that came up both um, up from people who are living in public housing as well as um, a broader population. Integrating multifamily throughout the town, mixed use housing above retail, preserving green space while providing more housing. And then some people just pointed to specific locations, Washington Square, Brookline Village, and Harvard Street being the most frequently mentioned. And there was a concern about displacing small businesses once again with the growth of housing. Daphne, I would just point out that we heard completely opposite perspectives on North Brookline in particular too. I was just, I was just gonna read okay. the quotes. I so cut you off, I'm sorry. <laughs> already done. More development should go to South Brookline or located in North Brookline because it's already urban in character already there, infrastructure is already there. And this just seems to, that's the, the, main, the main division yep. opinion. Next slide, please. 
So what would you say are housing issues the plan should, would, should be sure? The number one at the public forum in January was re renovate and maintain existing public housing, by far the number one. And then a lot of people talked about different tools to promote affordable housing, mostly through zoning and regulatory relief. The creation of an affordable housing over enjoyed a lot at the public forum. Existing housing into more units and housing with childcare and other wraparound services, especially for single mothers. And then plan for the public realm, public spaces, access for mostly in, you know, for, in terms of the concern for uh, climate change adaptation. Next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, Daphne, I think these are just um, extra oh, yes. responses. Increase yeah. to public transit and providing cycle works throughout the town. Increasing density. Yes. And again, here, it's about including the people who are seeking the housing in the decision making. So ensure adequate, equitable, and just representation on housing decision making the bodies that make those decisions and outreach to diverse potential residents. So do the outreach to the, sorry, do conduct the outreach to diverse potential residents. And then address the needs of additional infrastructure and amenities that additional housing will impact. So those concerns that some people have expressed, that they be addressed, that the, those concerns be addressed. Next slide, please. So we asked people at the public forum, if you could do one thing, to improve housing in Brookline, what would it be? Again, the absolute top of the list, the most frequently mentioned was improve the condition of public housing. And then more affordable housing should be an explicit priority of the town. Those were the two top responses. And then the affordable housing overlay district, as I said, received a lot of uh, support. Having the hospitals and nonprofits and, and, and using their payment in lieu of taxes and community benefits, many felt they didn't pay their fair share. I'm not saying that that's a fact, that's what many people stated. Uh, streamline the approval process for moderately sized multifamily housing near T-stops, which, which with the new state bill should be able to, to be you know, of help. And then housing and services for grand families using the Boston model where grandparents bring up their grandchildren in, in uh, units that are appropriately sized and also provide other supportive services. Next slide, please. Convert the Lincoln School to 100% affordable housing. Several people felt that was a good idea. Provide exemptions to zoning if a project meets affordable housing requirements, better access to public transport, affordable childcare, make public transit free, came up again. Mm. Um, Mayor Wu is, uh, doing a pilot on that in the city next door city of Boston. Equitable access to affordable housing, outreach to people of color communities and no local preference. I know that you recently reduced your local preference. Um, some people talk about expanding local preference to a larger region. So looking at local preference and what if it causes barriers or obstacles. Make affordable housing line item in the budget. So it's an annual line item. Provide incentives to landlords to keep rents low, reuse existing buildings, and more deeply affordable housing that's sustainable for families. Next slide, please. So the survey, the survey, it was online from January 31st to February 18th. It was based on the, two, on the 2016 survey so that the answers could be compared, which we haven't been able to do just yet as it you know, just recently closed. The survey should be seen as another way of taking the temperature. It's a way of allowing, kind of setting a broader net where more people can participate. It's not used as a statistically valid sample because it's self-select, whoever wants to take the survey takes the survey and it's certainly not a voting mechanism. And the, the numbers, when we, when we look at the numbers and we talk about percentages, it's really the percentage in terms of temperature, in terms of the people who participated, what did they say? Right. We're not making a broad generalization about the whole town. And were there duplicates? 
there certainly were, and there always are. Um, in this particular case, 149 responses came from shared devices out of 831 total responses. So this means that very likely there were um, households with more than one participant. So maybe a, a, a husband and wife or roommates shared a device and they wanted to have their, their own singular voice. And then surveys are often um, taken from libraries, schools, senior centers. And in fact, the one that the um, highest number of shared of responses from a shared device was four and it came from the high school. And Catherine here has done an incredible job of reviewing every single du duplicate individually and has flagged only 10 that made her feel like perhaps when you compare the responses, they're a little too similar. So 10 from 831, I would say that's pretty good. Next slide, please. So quickly, a, a, re a snapshot of who responded to the survey. Almost all have lived in Brookline between one and 30 years, so a broad range. Large majority are homeowners between 21 and 75 or older, but the majority 60 to 74 years old. Almost twice as many do not have children currently living at home. That's why they had time to take the survey. And of those with children, the majority are at the high school. Again, that's why they had time to take the survey. The large majority intend to stay in Brookline for at least five more years. And most of them live in Coolidge Corner, but then a lot more, uh, quite a few more uh, clustered in Brookline Village and Chestnut Hill, but all the neighborhoods are represented. Next slide, please. So how we asked, um, and here you see a, a breakdown of the ages, but we asked how important is it for you to stay in Brookline as you age? And 69% said it's extremely or very important to stay in Brookline. Of those who said it was extremely likely or likely to move out, over half cited the high level of housing and living costs among the important factors that would cause them to leave Brookline. Next slide, please. The three most commonly selected important enabling the residents to stay in Brookline as they age affordability in terms of property taxes, housing, and interestingly, pedestrian improvements, walkability, say for sidewalks, ramps, crosswalks, more and longer walk signals at crossings. Next slide, please. Where should housing in Brookline be developed? Well, you can see, again, the division, it's some, some people say anywhere, some people say everywhere, some people say where public transit, where public transportation, or some people say more specifically Newberry College, wherever commercial already is. So again, this needs to be tweaked in terms of the discussion. Next slide, please. When asked, what is your ideal community? What are the features that comprise an ideal community? The top five most commonly rated in terms of extremely important or important that comprise the ideal community. Safety, quality public schools, housing options close to public transit. And now you see why the desire for pedestrian and walkability improvements. Mm -hmm housing options close to services and shops, again, walkability, and a place with access to parks, recreational facilities, and opportunities for community gathering. Next slide, please. In terms of the top five most important housing initiatives, these were the top five that people in the survey felt should be explored. Encourage the preservation of existing homes, provide more options for low and moderate income people and families, encourage a creation of homes with a mix of price ranges, help people stay in the community as they age. And as you saw, a lot of the people responding wanted to stay in the community and age themselves and encourage creation of homes with convenient walk to business and services. Next slide. 
and we're now into part two. And I tried to go through this very quickly because we wanted to share all this with you, but we mostly want to hear from you, which now um, Dylan and Peter will help. So I'm going to stop sharing right now um, because our the other members of our consulting team are prepared to do a pretty extensive presentation and uh, you know uh, inquiry with you folks. And so Peter and Dylan, I think that you are on. Um, and I leave it to you to start your screen share. And we will try to keep an eye on the chat and help you if anything comes up that looks like we would, that would be good for you to try to answer in the meeting as opposed to later. Good evening, everybody. I'm Dylan Sussman. I'm from Dodson and Flinker. Um, as Judy mentioned, we are partners on this team and we're a landscape architecture and planning firm. Um, and we're mostly focused on the, uh, on the design part of this project, which is a, a special addition added on to the scope, which I'll describe a little bit later on. Um, so we're gonna do a mix of presentation. Um, there are gonna be some polls. There's gonna be some opportunities for chat discussion. Um, and then we're gonna go back and have more presentation interspersed with polls and then have some time at the end for more freewheeling uh, chat and possibly verbal discussion. So tonight our goal is to explore the range of neighborhood contexts in Brookline to get your input on that. Talk about um, design features that might be most important for affordable and mixed income housing in various neighborhood settings. Um, and then when looking at specific sites, um, get your input on how to balance the competing needs of people who need affordable housing, developers, residents of Brookline as a whole, town government, and abutters. Um, so, <clears throat> as you probably know, in 2016, Brookline prepared a housing production plan, uh, and it included this map, which shows locations that were deemed to be suitable for housing. Um, and that was based on factors like proximity to transit, proximity to goods and services and open spaces. Um, as well as some sense of, of feasibility for redevelopment. Um, we're gonna produce this kind of map in this project, but that's not our focus tonight. Our focus isn't on really where should affordable housing be, um, but rather um, what characteristics of, of housing, mixed income and affordable housing should there be in various contexts. So, as I mentioned earlier, there's, there's an addition to the scope that goes beyond uh, for this project that goes beyond a typical housing production plan. Um, and that's called location-based testing. It basically means looking at actual sites in Brookline um, and exploring what's feasible in terms of um, development on those sites for housing. There's a number of purposes for doing that. One of them is to identify characteristics of development that might be preferred by members of the community. Um, another is to identify the barriers to affordable housing created by the town zoning. So zoning is voluminous, it's text heavy, it's complicated. Um, it becomes a lot more uh, comprehensible if you actually look at a real place and go through the process of trying to figure out what developing development on that site um, it plays out, how development on a site plays out when you're looking at the, the actual zoning. Um, and we'll show you a little bit of that tonight. And then to identify sites where the town would support and encourage friendly 40B and other affordable housing projects, to provide information for setting housing production targets. So if we can figure out how much um, housing is possible on particular sites, maybe we can abstract that to housing production targets across the town as a whole. Um, to inform discussions of how to maximize the benefits of affordable housing. And then finally, to inform discussions of which strategies might be most feasible and effective for meeting the town's housing production needs. So those are the purposes of the location-based testing. Um, but again, tonight we're really focused on kind of those, those first bullet points, which is not uh, where should house, affordable housing be located, but what are the key design characteristics of different neighborhoods that should be taken into account when designing new housing? That's gonna help us do two things. One of them is gonna help us identify sites to use in the location-based testing process. And it's gonna help us um, understand what range of, of um, sort of 
opportunities we should explore for those sites. Okay, so we're gonna take a step back now. Um, it helps to look at the past or the present to understand the future. Um, so these are maps showing you housing that has, that's in on the left, housing that's in the pipeline. Um, these are either zoning permits or building permits that have been issued since 2017. Uh, the little blue dots, uh, primarily in, in the south of Brookline are one unit uh, structures that have been permitted. The um, purple dots are two to three units. You can see those sort of cluster mostly on the edges of your major corridors and some in, in um, North Brookline. And then the salmon colored dots are four unit plus buildings that have been permitted. And they largely cluster along the major corridors uh, in Brookline was a few outliers. Of those, um, the ones shown on the map on the right include some affordable housing or um, cash payments for, for affordable housing. So the Pentagons are 40B projects. 40B, I think Judy described earlier. Um, it's a particular form of permitting that, um, that includes affordable housing um, and enables a developer to um, not follow some aspects of your, your standard zoning. So uh, there have been a reasonable number of 40B projects in Brookline in the last few years, um, pretty strongly clustered in the north of Brookline and predominantly along Harvard uh, Street or Ave, I can't remember right now, Harvard Street. Um, and then these stars are inclusionary zoning projects. So those are projects where um, the project proponent, the developer, or the applicant is required to include uh, some amount of affordable housing, or for smaller projects, um, they can provide a cash payment in lieu of providing houses. So only one of those has, um, a, has units and a cash payment, um, and one has units. And I believe the one that has units and a cash payment actually has not been constructed yet. Um, of the 40 Bs that have been gone through the permitting process, only three of those have been built, all of them along Harvard Street. Um, and we're going to look at those and then ask you, essentially, what do you think of them? Um, did they do a good job of fitting into their neighborhood? So the first of those is 420 Harvard Street, also known as JFK Crossing. Uh, like I said, it's a 40 B project. Um, you can see in the picture that it's a five-story building. Um, it has what are called step backs, which means that um, some parts of the, of the building are pushed further away from the property lines than other parts. So in this case, the first floor is closest to the front property line. It's right up on the sidewalk. Um, the second through fourth floors is stepped back a little bit from that front facade. And then the fifth story in this building is, is stepped back significantly on all sides, particularly the back. Um, there are 23 uh, units in this building, um, and 20% of those are affordable at 50% of the area median income. There's also commercial space on the first floor, um, and there is parking underneath. So these are floor plans of the building. Um, this is the below grade garage. So you can see there's a ramp that comes down and then parking underneath. Um, the property, the, the, the project actually stretches over two properties and the garage um, goes into this 49 Coolidge property. Um, on, this, on the ground floor, there's retail, a ramp for the parking and then lobby and leasing space and so on. And then up above, you've got Units clustered around the center hall, that's second or fourth floor. And the fifth floor, you can see that step back, right? So this is the building footprint. Um, and there's, there's basically a penthouse up here with two units. Um, and it only covers about 50% of the building footprint. Um, I'm going to show you some images of what the context looks like, because we're going to ask you about how the building fit with its context. Um, so you can see that 
along Harvard Street here, you mostly have one story commercial structures. Um, back getting into the neighborhood, there's larger houses, traditional looking houses mixed in with some, um, you know, this is a four story apartment building back here um, on the side street. Okay, I'm gonna move on to 384 Harvard Street. This is also known as the Brown Family House. Um, it's a two life communities um, property. Again, it's a 40B project. This one is six stories. Uh, it again has step backs. It has a very large uh, step back between the first floor and then the second through, through six floors. Um, there's 62 units in this building, so more than twice as large as the previous one. Um, more of the units in this building are affordable, so 50% of the units uh, are affordable at 60% of AMI. Eight units are affordable at 110% of AMI. That's sometimes referred to as a workforce housing. Um, and then four of the units are unrestricted, meaning you could have any income and live in them. Um, and this is an age restricted building. It's senior housing, 62 plus. Um, it's got 5,000 square feet of commercial. Um, and parking in this one is what we call tuck under parking, meaning it's sort of within the building footprint on the ground floor. So the previous one had parking below grade. This one has parking on the ground floor. Um, and that's important because uh, accommodating this parking, as you can see, takes up a pretty good portion of the ground floor of this building. It's a little less than a half. Um, the previous one, which had more parking compared to the number of units, um, had to basically go to a whole nother subsurface level and into the neighborhood pro neighboring property um, to get the amount of parking. Um, and those, those parking numbers for these properties is significantly less than what's required under the buyer zoning, if you follow the zoning as it's written. Um, upper floors, again, apartments clustered around central hallways. And then the sixth floor, you can see that it's stepped back again, so it's smaller than the other typical upper floors. Um, there's a, a roof deck up here, so uh, the building is pushed back from Harvard Street even further. In its context, it's next to a synagogue. Across the street, there's some three-story um, multifamily buildings. Uh, there's a very large multifamily building um, on the block behind. Uh, I'm not gonna count them, but I'm guessing it's about 10 stories. Um, so this, this context, and then there's some houses as well. Um, so this context is a little bit more varied, right? It's very close. You can, you can literally see 420 Harvard Street in this photo. So there's 420 and then the project we're talking about. Very close to each other, but the context is, um, is different, at least the immediate context. And then the last one, this is uh, 455 Harvard Street. Again, it's a 40B project. Um, it's four stories. It has a small step back, step back on the fourth floor. And there's 17 units in this building. Four of those are affordable at 50% of the area median income. Um, 1,800 square feet of commercial space on the first floor. And the parking is over here. There's a driveway that goes into parking on the first floor that takes up, I'd say two thirds of the first floor approximately. Um, and these parking spots are stacker units. So there's a, there's a car elevator in there um, to be able to fit the cars into the very small parking lot on the first floor of the building. Context, um, there's a gas station on one side of the property. There's a gas station across the street from the property. Um, there's some, some smaller one-story commercial buildings down the street, uh, sort of fairly cohesive neighborhoods of houses on both sides of Harvard Street here. And then along Harvard Street, there's some, there's some pretty big surface parking lots. So one immediately next door to 455 Harvard and then the TJ Maxx parking lot uh, down Harvard Street a bit more just beyond this photo. Um, so at, at this point on Harvard Street, the character is transitioning to sort of 
um, a more, I would call strip commercial character or transitional character. Okay, so Catherine, would you launch the poll, please? Excellent. So the question here, you can move your little poll window around to be able to see all the pictures. Uh, the question is, which projects are appropriate for their context? And you can choose A, B, C, or none of the above. So you can choose all of those, you can choose none of them. And then if you're finished with the poll uh, in, in chat, it would be great if you could answer why or why not. Um, and so to do that, it'd be great if you'd say like appropriate because or inappropriate because. Dylan, there's someone in the chat saying that they don't understand the question. So I don't know if you could um, kind of restate it. Sure, yeah. Um, so we're looking to know whether you feel like these buildings fit into their neighborhood. Um, do, they, do they feel like buildings that looking to the future for Brookline are appropriate for future developments in similar locations? And then there was a question about where do I say why it is appropriate? I assume, is that the chat? That's the chat, yep. Okay. All right, and Dylan, there's someone asking if you, we know the name of the developments. If we know the names of the developments? Yeah, so the first one was the 420 Harvard JFK Crossing. The second one um, is the Brown Family House. And that, that's the Two Life Community. And the third one is 455 Harvard on the right of the image. As, as somebody pointed out, you can check multiple boxes or none of the above. And as you're answering the question in the chat, you might also distinguish, you know, does this fit in in terms of use? Like, do we want more ground floor retail? Is that a, a benefit to the neighborhood? Do we want more residences above the retail? Is that a benefit? And then there's the question of design, of course, which is, do you want a building that looks very contemporary? Uh, or do you want something that you wouldn't know that it was new, uh, if that's possible? Um, I mean, these and other examples that we're showing you tonight, we're trying to focus on buildings that people are actually building that contain affordable housing of one kind or another. Uh, we know that if you spend an infinite amount of money, you can make everything look great. Um, but that's probably not feasible in all sites. So we're really, we're thinking about what, what is likely to be feasible for a typical developer who can include some affordable housing, if not all affordable housing on a property. And um, what kinds of design approaches allow you to do that and, and still fit into the, the community or a particular neighborhood within the community? All right, so we have the poll results um, of the, about half the people who participated in the poll, um, and 78% of them said that that first image, the 420 Harvard, was appropriate. 74 said the second um, Brown family house is appropriate. And then 65 said that C was appropriate. And then 12% of the people said that none of the projects were appropriate at all. Um, Judy, Peter, Daphne, do you want to read some of these chat comments? So there seems to be um, a variety of opinions. Uh, for example, I chose A because the color scheme is far the far most subdued. The others shout out. It could be significantly improved. They didn't make the sidewalk look dark and forbidding. C it is unattractive. It fits its immediate unattractive commercial streetscape. <laughs> so it's unattractive, but it fits into an unattractive already streetscape. Um, market rate rentals subsidize the affordable uses. It's a hamster wheel that you can never catch up to. Buildings are fine except for lack of green space. Empty storefronts are a problem. People asked earlier whether all the units were, uh, were occupied in, in each of the examples. 
height is first, one story is too low, four to six floors with a top setback is generally okay. Architectural design that is more contemporary should be encouraged. And if that's the Jim Bachelor, I think it is, he's an architect. Appropriate because they are in a walkable commercial mixed use corridor with good transit, reduced parking and ground floor retail. I walked the street today and sat opposite each and they were attractive. So. All right. Great, thank you everybody for your feedback. And obviously we're gonna save the chat. And so we're gonna read all of your feedback um, and consider it. Um, so it's not just disappearing into the ether. Okay. Um, we're gonna move on to the next part of the presentation. And Peter is going to take over here. Yeah, I think, thanks Dylan. As, as you said earlier, um, part of what we'll be doing with this project is looking at what we're calling location-based testing sites. And the idea here is to not just look at affordable housing in a very abstract way uh, and draw general bubbles on a map, but to try to learn about how to make affordable housing fit better how to make any kind of housing fit better in a variety of neighborhood types across the community um, by looking at actual sites. And these, of course, these scenarios are gonna be completely imaginary. The owners of these properties are, some of them are owned by the, the city, but for the most part, the owners have not been consulted uh, in any detail about any of the, the ideas. And so these, basically it's a typical kind of a planning process where we look at uh, real sites, we run through somewhat imaginary scenarios, look at different alternatives for the future and then try to learn from those. And so what we'll be doing as we go forward over the next couple of months is looking at probably a dozen different sites uh, and exploring those, talking to people about them and then thinking about, well, you know, what, what does that tell us? So anyway, We've starting out with six sites that were chosen uh, in consultation with our, our working group. Um, all of these are sort of feasible. They seem to be feasible future sites for redevelopment. They're either undeveloped or sort of in, in waiting for to be redeveloped logically or they're owned by the town. Um, and so by looking at these, we can sort of test the process of, of what we're going through as well as learning something about these particular sites. And as you can see, they, they fall into you know, sort of different areas across, across Brookline. Um, the first one is uh, Babcock Street parking lot, which is town owned. Uh, there's so-called Newbury West parcels, also town owned, which are uh, the west part of the, the campus that was purchased a couple of years ago. Uh, we're looking at uh, Route 9 or Boylston Street at Hammond Street on the western, southwestern side of town. Uh, we'll be looking at the stop and shop and the abutting parcels, thinking about how that might be redeveloped if and when stop and shop is no longer. Well, I mean, one of the scenarios will be thinking of keeping stop and shop on that site, uh, but then perhaps you could add housing above it or next to it, as has been done in a number of places around the country. Uh, we'll also be looking at uh, Washington Square, which is really emblematic of one of the old uh, streetcar corridors. And then um, Emerald Isle, the River Road site, which is part of an area that really has been um, transformed over the last uh, few years and is sort of area of major change. So again, these sites were chosen because they all seem to be good ways to explore this idea, this question of how to make housing fit into different neighborhoods. They don't represent a decision of any kind, but really a way to learn about, um, again, how to make housing fit. So the first one we're gonna look at is the Babcock Street parking lot. The next slide, Dylan. Yep. Um, this is a site a little bit more than half an acre uh, on Babcock and John Street, just off of Harvard Street. You can see it's surrounded by the blue dash there uh, currently has 47 parking spaces. Um, now the next slide. Um, sure. 
we'll see some uh, ground level views. Um, this in terms of context, I mean, it's interesting because it's almost completely surrounded by um, you know, three, four story apartment buildings um, and has you know, a fairly nice walkable streetscape with sidewalks and street trees. And obviously we're not, uh, the purpose of this again is not to decide, oh, we don't need parking here, so let's get rid of it. It's really thinking about on a site like this, what could housing look like? Um, so the first question is, what could you do under the current zoning? Uh, which is next slide, I think. So it's in the, uh, the M2.0 district, which is multifamily housing at a floor area ratio of 2.0, which means that the floor area of the building can be twice the area of the lot. So that means that on a, a lot that's 26,000 some, we can have a, a gross floor area build out of 52,280 square feet. That has to be contained in a building that's no more than 50 feet tall. And one of the key things that we're discovering about Brookline zoning is that parking requirements are, are pretty stiff um, for good reason, because you don't have a lot of excess parking. And clearly uh, the decision was made at one point so that when you develop a site, you should have parking to serve that site. Uh, as, we'll well, as we'll discuss, that has perhaps unintended consequences. But what we've seen in all these sites is it's a pretty high level of parking that's required. And we'll, we'll show how that affects the potential build out. In the next slide. So the first thing we're, we're looking at and what we'll show you tonight is really what could you do under the current zoning? These are not recommendations for a particular site, but really an exploration of what would a developer likely be able to do um, or what could the town do if it was town on site uh, to develop this under the zoning. So as I said, the, the build out under the FAR of 2.0 allows for 52,000 square feet. Um, we figured out how that could be arranged in a five story building, you know, within the, the 50 foot height limit with each floor being about 10,400 square feet, uh, resulting in for the sake of argument, 29 one and two bedroom units and 10 three bedroom units. So again, the key, key result of this, if you look at the parking requirements under the zoning, that ends up requiring 88 parking spaces um, to fit the town's requirement of the zoning of two spaces per unit. Uh, and then the next slide will show the site. Uh, is an aerial view. Uh, the blue is the outline of the site. Again, a little bit more than half of an acre, currently used as a parking lot. And the next one shows that five-story building. And the reason it's sort of set within that white setback is because the zoning also requires minimum setbacks from each of the lot lines, the front line, the side lines, and so on. I think it's like 20 feet in front, 33 feet from the side. And of course, when you look at the you know, the context of the neighborhood, you see that all of the buildings pretty much are right on the lot line. Uh, so the first question is, you know, is this a good, you know, should zoning be requiring those setbacks or not? Um, do we, uh, but again, someone else said in the, in the chat, we need more green space around those buildings. Uh, so of course, if you have more green space, the building gets put in the center of the lot, like you're showing here, and it becomes higher. Whereas perhaps if you could build in put the building up to the street, you could have more green space in the back for a given building. So the next slide shows where the parking goes, which is underneath that building. Uh, so there's no, there's no room for a surface parking on the site unless you build a very smaller, much smaller building, uh, but you could build uh, levels of parking underneath the building, which would be accessed by a ramp on one side. And actually with the configuration of this site, there's a fairly good uh, possibility of building parking underneath because you could get two full bays of parking um, and for a variety of reasons, it's pretty efficient. So basically the 88 units or the 88 parking spaces would all be underground. As we're seeing a lot in terms of recent development, there's a ramp that goes down and parking either behind the building or underneath. So that's the people sort of the first site. About roof gardens. Sorry, Peter, several people are suggesting roof gardens for the green space. Right. 
that's a good idea. So we want to stop after that first one and ask another poll question, which Dylan will introduce. Okay, <clears throat> so it's essentially the same poll question, which is uh, we're showing you four examples of um, buildings around the Northeast. Um, all of these buildings contain some proportion of affordable housing. Um, and they're, they're different scales and sizes and different design approaches. Um, so the question is, which of these examples would be appropriate for the 15 Babcock Street site, the one that Peter just showed? Um, so it's a multiple choice question. You can answer any of the options. You can check them all. You can check none of the above, or you can check just one. So is A appropriate? These are, um, this is one development with two different buildings, each three stories. Option B is four story or four stories essentially with sort of a below grade first floor, they're walk-up apartments. Option C is three stories with a step back, so four stories. And then option uh, D has six stories. Dylan, someone is asking where these are from. Well, um, does it matter? Does that change whether they're appropriate or not? Um, A is from Boston, B is from Brooklyn, C is from Boston, and D is from, I believe, Boston. And then again, we're not recommending, I mean, this is not a choice between these buildings for this site, but we're, uh, we're not making recommendations about architecture yet, but we're really using these to try to spur this conversation and sort of get your, your quick reaction. Um, so again, you know, you might in the chat say, as some people already are, uh, some of these are too tall. Um, so it might be about the height of the building or how it steps back in relationship to the street. Or it might be that about the design of the building, how you like a building that, you know, relates to the street. So you walk by and you can see the doors and look into the windows, or, or maybe you like something different. Yeah, someone says this is a difficult question because there are so many variables. Yeah, uh, and yeah that's that's the point. And part of what we're we're doing with this study is really looking at what are those variables, and can we separate out things like uses, um, which sort of reply imply sort of functional characteristics and impacts. Can we separate out uses from functions and functions from design, and think about you know, when people like a building or don't like a building, why? Is it because of the design or is it because uh, they're uncomfortable with new neighbors? Um, is it because they feel like it's, you know, too close to the street or is it, you know, the, the materials that are used on the building? Right. Um, so, Dylan, I just want to say there's a comment in the chat about um, uh, being confused about the focus on design and aesthetics versus need. Um, and so I don't know if there's a way to kind of just like reiterate how, how it all ties together for the, the overall uh, project and, you know, kind of the purpose of this conversation tonight, not taking away from the conversation of need as well. Right. Yeah, so there's... Um... As, as Judy mentioned in the beginning, there's, you know, pretty extensive look at need. There's been extensive uh, focus groups and conversations and a survey, all of which focus on need. There's an additional part of this housing production plans scope, which, um, you know, the town put out to bid and we responded to. So we're following that scope, which is looking at specific locations in Brookline um, and trying to figure out what uh, it's possible to do with those in terms of housing production. Um, and in order to understand what's possible to do with them, um, we need to look at A, the zoning. Um, so we're showing you what things are like if you build them out under the zoning. And B, um, if you, you know, if you were to contemplate either development that goes through a 40B project, in which case the zoning becomes um, more flexible, we'll say, or if you're gonna contemplate zoning changes, what would be appropriate? 
Um, and then you get into kind of, you get into design, not necessarily design like I like the windows or I don't like the windows or um, those materials are terrible, but design in terms of like how big the building is, um, how many stories it has, possibly how the, the, the shape of the building is configured. Um, so for some people in Brookline, we heard in the first meeting that design doesn't matter at all. They just want more housing and they want that housing to be affordable across a broad range of incomes. For other people in Brookline, um, design does matter. And um, so we're looking to get input from both of those groups about, you know, about design. And we're open to all perspectives on it. So hopefully Thank you, that want to just say also that um, somebody said when Peter was talking about the, the functional aspects, someone said, well, which building has the most affordable units? And that that would be a feature that would help, help them select that building. But also for those who are, are saying that, you know, it's just about um, it's just about providing housing and design a second. We talked earlier about stigmatization and isolation and feeling as though you know the housing isn't integrated, that people who live in the affordable units may not feel integrated. Design can help with that as well. So it's, it's multifactorial. So I, I would also just note to um, Peter and Dylan, as we continue to work on these scenarios, to make sure that your parking assumptions include the reduction that was recently approved at town meeting for affordable units, because you know, actually that could benefit the, the number, you know, the, the, the amount of the project that's actually affordable. So we, we'll make sure that we, you know, get that squared away too. But I think the point is, you know, it, it's a good question about which type of development will have the most affordable units. And to some extent, that's not only just about how big is it, but what is the depth of subsidy in the project? because the deeper the affordability, I mean, we've already talked in this uh, two meetings now about how the, the need for deeply affordable units is such a pressing issue in Brookline and that takes subsidy. It isn't, it isn't gonna be something that gets fixed by zoning. It isn't gonna be something that gets fixed by a big project. It takes money. So, you know, we have to kind of think about those factors too. All right. Um, thank you, Judy. So. The, the results of the poll basically, B was at 50%. There were other buildings were below 50%. Right. People saying they're not appropriate. Um, the majority of people saying they're not appropriate, although very close to, you know, they're in the 40 to 50 range. And then 16% of people said none of the above. Okay. Okay. Um, we're gonna move on now. We are looking at your comments um, and We'll take all that feedback into consideration. Yep. Um, and I just, I just want to follow up on what Judy said. Uh, the question of which one is most affordable, which one has the most affordable housing is more complex than just the building itself. Um, so I don't know that you can just look at one of these buildings and say, this is the one that has the most affordable housing in it. Um, it has to do with who's building it and what they want to get out of the project. And then how can they arrange the funding to make that possible? We did, I think we said earlier, we did make an effort to pick out examples, which all of these include some affordable housing. Um, because, you know, you can start to see somebody talked about boxes. Um, right. There is a relationship between affordability and design. And the, the big difference, as you see in all of these examples, is that um, in order to keep the, the overall cost down, you, you try to get as close to a box as you can while still making nice architecture. And basically every building that you see being built uh, in the greater Boston area these days is about that question. Um, you can make a really nice building again if you can spend infinite amount of money, but even on market rate housing, uh, developers are having to set a balance and so the question is how, you know, which approaches, I mean, what we'll be thinking about, what approaches uh, really get something that fits well, that has a kind of dynamic, interesting architecture um, that doesn't shout, but also doesn't hit you in the face, um, but still is something that uh, 
of developers likely to be able to build and include affordable housing. Um, so it's a really interesting question. And I think we're getting a lot of great comments and we'll be interested to go through those. There's so another we're, comments. Sorry, sorry, there's another ahead, set of comments that have to do with whether or not one first pr produces the housing and then decides what the impact on uh, municipal services and facilities and infrastructure is, or whether one first uh, figures out the impact, provides the additional services um, and infrastructure, and then develops the housing. So there seems to be a, a, a set of comments related to the impact on municipal services and infrastructure. Which I think, again, you know, Daphne, are those are factors that the town is going to have to think about as they weigh our recommendations. Um, I don't, I'm not trying to dismiss the concern. It's just that that's really kind of this bigger policy question that we know the town's going to need to wrestle with. Um, but it's not what we're focusing on. And also the way I always see it too, is that if, if the town decides that it is a priority to create more affordable housing, that's the goal. And then you have to figure out how to get there. And so if getting there, it means improvements to or additional facility services, then, then the town has to grapple with that. So it has to decide what is its goal? What is its priority? And those have to be weighed. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the age old challenge in public policy of competing public interests. Precisely. So let's, um, let's keep going. We are, as I said, we're gonna be doing like 12 different um, test sites. Tonight, we're, we've only <laughs> brought three of them, um, but we tried to pick out three to start with that really show a range of contexts because uh, we thought that would help sort of spur the conversation. So the second one is the so-called Newbury West site on Fisher Ave between Fisher Ave and Hislop Road. Um, currently it's got the old college buildings on it. There's a large uh, sort of institutional you know, classroom, a laboratory building. There's uh, a house and then some large parking lots. Total site area, 136,000 square feet, a um, little bit more than three acres. And uh, the existing area, floor area, the building's about 55,000 square feet. Um, next one. So from the, from the street, you see, I think it's a 1957 um, building that sort of dominates the site with uh, sort of lawn on the, on the Fisher Ave site and the parking lot and the entrances on the Hislop Road site. And then uh, further south on Fisher Ave, there's a large parking lot. And then the opposite side of that, there's a, sort of a grand home. I'm not quite sure what the use of it was originally. So what we're assuming for the sake of this uh, question, which is what could you build on the site in the future, is that uh, we could remove these buildings and you know, what would you replace them with if you were following the zoning? So the next slide shows, again, what the zoning requires for the site. It's a uh, sort of combination of the S 25 of the S15 districts, residential only uh, allowed. Uh, primarily, most of the site is 25,000 square foot minimum lot size with a maximum FAR of 0.2. Um, so on a 10,000 square foot light lot, you could build a fifth of that 0.2 or a 2,000 square foot house. And on a 25, thousand square foot lot, which is what we'll be showing you, you could build a 5,000 square foot house, uh, maximum height of 35 feet and two spaces per unit. So the next slide shows uh, the site. This is looking uh, west over Fisher Ave. Um, and the next one shows pretty much the only thing you could build on the current zoning, which is sort of keeping the one uh, existing home and replacing the larger institutional building and parking lots with four more uh, large homes between 5,000 and 5,600 square feet. And those boxes within the, the boxes are the setback requirements of zoning. And again, setbacks with the front yard and the side yard and the rear yard pretty much require that the building be placed in the center of the lot, whatever the size. Um, and so this is pretty much the only thing that zoning allows by right. So the next slide again, uh, we were looking at uh, 
sort of different styles of affordable housing that might fit into this neighborhood. Um, obviously you could build a large brick apartment building or any kind of building on here, but we thought for the sake of discussion, we'd show a number of different examples on the upper right is a cottage community with sort of small single family houses. On uh, a B sort of represents uh, duplex houses, um, sort of fairly close together. C is sort of a large single uh, apartment or townhouse complex. And uh, D is sort of a large building broken up. It's apartments, but it's broken up in smaller sort of residential units. Dylan, anything you want to add about this one? Yeah, so these um, represent different approaches to creating affordability. Um, none of these was designed to be purely an affordable housing project. Um, all of them use market rate um, units to subsidize uh, affordable housing. Um, the first one uses very small units to make them more affordable um, so that both the market rate and the um, income restricted units are cheaper. Uh, the second one sort of clusters the buildings closer together. Um, it has duplexes instead of single family houses to make them more affordable than large single family houses. Um, the third one is in Lincoln and the town kicked in a million dollars to make this project possible. And the fourth one, um, it's, you know, tries to fit into a residential neighborhood while still having a pretty substantial size building. And the, the density can be surprising. I mean, we've looked at, you know, cottage communities with small, small houses set close together and you can get densities of 25 and 30 units per acre, which is basically what you get with uh, a three-story apartment building. Um, it does, obviously, again, it's cheaper to build a single building than to build multiple small buildings. Um, but again, we sort of thought it would be interesting to explore different ideas, so. Um, and in the chat, if, you know, please tell us why you think these are appropriate or not appropriate. And also if there are other building types that you think would be appropriate here. So do you think that, um, uh, three flats, like a, a, what I what we call a triple decker in Worcester where I'm from, would that be appropriate on this site? Um, would small apartment buildings with four or five or six units be appropriate on this site? Uh, would some of the examples like the ones you saw before be appropriate on this site? All right, I think we've probably hit up. I was gonna say it's time to close the poll, but somebody just answered. So I'll give one last count to five and then close the poll. All right, so in this, in this case, um, only 3% said none of these were appropriate. 54% um, said A was appropriate. 54% said B was appropriate. 69% said C was appropriate and 70% said D was appropriate. Um, so, I, I mean, I, what I would take from that is it seems like people feel like the bigger buildings are more appropriate in this location. Um, but maybe you all are thinking of something else. So please tell us in the chat what you were thinking. Um, and I have to say there are a lot of messages in the chat, so uh, it's hard to keep up with. Last example. So, so sorry, Dylan, but uh, there was some discussion about you know, are we going to take this information and then decide that, that, that this is what, you know, people said five stories and we're going with five stories. This is a process. This is an iterative process. And we're trying to have a discussion with a large group of people that are, we're not even in the room with. So please be generous um, and patient as we try to understand what it is that you think fits in Brookline and what the factors are. Yeah, so um, I probably haven't been clear enough about the process. Um, so what we're doing is we've been in the contract, it says that we should produce some scenarios for each of these sites. Um, and so we're gonna produce a range of scenarios to explore. So you've seen the first one, which is the build out under current zoning. Um, and then we'll look at other scenarios. So what we're trying to get input from you, one, one thing that we're gonna use your input for is to get a sense of what range of scenarios should we explore for each of these sites? Um, 
us drawing a little picture does not make a policy change for the town. It doesn't mean that any that the zoning is going to change, right? That takes a whole public process. It doesn't mean that any uh, that the town is going to actually build something, for example, on the Babcock Street site. Um, it doesn't mean that um, a developer is going to come and say, oh, they said this was good in this report, I'm going to do it. Um, there's plenty of public process with any of these examples after the conclusion of the housing production plan. Um, but the scenarios in the housing production plan will give you a range of things to consider um, to have further community discussion upon. All right, uh, so this is the, the last one we want to talk about tonight. And again, we're just showing the sort of the base of what could you build under existing zoning. And then uh, as we move forward, we're thinking about what's, what else is possible. Uh, so this is looking at the uh, intersection of Boylston Street and Hammond Street. Um, the total site area sort of includes, I think, 10 different properties in this one block. Um, totaling 70,000 square feet, so something less than two acres. And currently, it's sort of split, um, mostly one-story one, one buildings along Boylston Street and triple-deckers in the back, and there's a total of about 38,500 square feet of existing buildings. The next slide uh, shows sort of an aerial view of that. So you can see there's sort of, I think, three different banks um, along the stretch and a number of, uh, of rental, uh, biz, rental business spaces. And then again, the residential units along the back. The next slide shows uh, some ground level views. So again, this is an area that's in transition. It's got uh, some sort of different commercial spaces, pretty much automobile related um, visitation spaces, banks, realtors, um, and I think there's a large daycare um, or a preschool in the middle of it, um, and then rental apartments in the back. The current zoning, you have to go to the next one, uh, sort of a combination of general business at a 1.0 FAR along the frontage, and then there's a parcel, several parcels in the back that are multifamily zoning. Um, so if you look at uh, what's allowed under the uh, the maximum FAR, it's basically you could build as much square footage on buildings as there is in the site, sort of one-to-one. -one. So 70,251 square foot total site area, and then you could build 70,251 square feet of buildings. Now, as you saw in the earlier slide, there's only about 38,000 square feet of existing buildings. And the reason is that um, there's not a lot of room for parking once you build the buildings without doing structured parking. And we'll show how that works. Um, the next slide shows um, at the bottom there is a, a sketch that shows one way this could be developed under the current zoning. And basically it's replacing the existing buildings with new um, commercial buildings along Boylston Street with large parking lots in the back. And the reason you need those large parking lots, and I won't read all the detailed text there, is that um, for the retail spaces, for every thousand square feet of, of, of business space, you need five parking spaces, which basically is at least 1,500 square feet of pavement. So you think about for every square foot, you need one and a half times the amount of paved parking spaces. So what we've done for the sake of this argument is sort of assuming the site, it's now 10 properties. Some of them are already owned by one entity in common. So we're sort of, for the sake of argument, breaking this up into sort of three, three areas. One, the sort of the, the, the west, the east side, which is Century Bank, Rockland Trust agglomeration. And then there's 1198, 1210 Boylston Street, and then the other Boylston Street parcel. But all of them basically could be developed as separate entities or as a single large development, but they pretty much would follow this pattern because of that parking requirement. So if you go to the next slide, um, this is again, an aerial view of the site under existing conditions. And then we could look at that build out diagram laid over the site. 
on the next slide, which is the pink is basically um, one story of retail on the ground floor. And then the yellow is either one or two stories of residential uses above that. And um, then you see the parking that's required. So this is basically the way that you could get the FAR on the site of a one-to-one. One one. You have to build a large, uh, you basically pave everything you can. And then underneath that large square, uh, there's a second level of parking underneath. So if you go back to the, uh, the build out numbers briefly. Um, so Peter, I'm, I'm, I'm learning from a chat that apparently we misread the zoning um, and that parking is not required for retail on this site um, because of, I believe in overlay districts. Um, so I think from what I've heard in the chat, we might've made a couple of mistakes about parking, um, parking requirements, and we apologize for that. Um, We've, we've looked at your zoning, tried to understand it. Um, the zoning in Brookline is, um, it doesn't excuse our, our mistakes, but the zoning in Brookline is extremely complicated. Um, I would say it's the most complicated zoning I've seen anywhere. Um, so we will continue to, to try to understand it and we'll work with the staff to make sure that, you know, the future graphics we produce are actually correct for what zoning says now. In any case, if you go to the three-dimensional view, um, this is likely uh, what people would build in this situation. So this, uh, the zoning may allow less parking, um, but it doesn't allow more development. So basically in order to uh, meet the FAR requirement, this is what meets that requirement. So currently uh, you couldn't add a, a lot more development on the site within the, the 1.0 FAR requirement. And in a location like this, you know, even if you eliminated the, the parking requirement, the developers uh, will want to provide the parking that their tenants require because that's part of what tenants are looking for. So I wouldn't be surprised uh, unless you change the FAR requirement, which is certainly an option, uh, you're not gonna get a lot more development than this on the site and you're likely to see a good part of it being paved as well. So again, the question is, um, you know, this, this again is sort of the base level. And the question is what type of development would fit better into a context like this part of Boylston Street? I think we have one more poll question about that. There, yeah, our last poll question. Are any of these examples appropriate for this site? Um, and like, like the, the community-wide survey, um, obviously these are not scientific polls. You guys are not necessarily a representative sample of Brookline, um, but it does, does give us a sense of what the group of people who showed up at the meeting tonight think. And that's balanced with all the other forms of input that we get throughout the process. And then all the conversations that happen in other venues in your community. And you're really helping us understand, you know, what's important to talk about when we talk about design. I mean, we have one idea um, as designers, but we really want to understand what's important. So again, we're not making decisions, but we're trying to figure out, well, what do people care about and why? And what does that mean for zoning? And should we change zoning to be more in line with what people care about? and try to avoid the things that they don't want. Um, and Peter, didn't you select these sites in part to represent different conditions throughout Brookline so that it's not that this particular site would have this, but it's that these are conditions that represent other locations in town. And you're just kind of exploring what people feel about what would be most important in that particular context. Yeah, and part of what we're learning tonight is how do we talk about this? Um, this is, we're doing this, this testing of 
you know, the 12 or 15 sites, I think. And the, and the question is, how do we do that test? What's important to show and how do we do it? Um, so this is, yeah, it's gonna be ongoing for the next couple of months and I do appreciate your input tonight. In addition to that, uh, people are talking about a whole lot of other factors that are not necessarily directly related to design that we need to lift up and keep in mind and make sure are addressed. Right, somebody pointed out about the importance of the opportunity to create neighborhood shared spaces, play spaces and gardens, which you know are not really visible in these typical kind of architecture pictures. Uh, some extent, like in number A there, we see a, lar a large plaza. So we could assume that that could form a nice community space. Uh, we can see you know, parking or uh, sidewalks and street trees that we know are likely to create a, a nice place to walk. Um, but we don't really know, you know how these spaces might be used, who owns them, whether they're open to the public even. Okay, so the results of this poll, 80% um, of people said that A was appropriate, 39 said B was appropriate, 45% said that C was appropriate, and 65% um, said D was appropriate, and 7% said none of the above. Okay, we're gonna stop sharing there, um, and we're going to end the presentation. Okay, so there have been a lot of comments in the chat. Um, some of them are about, why are we doing this? Some of them are uh, about design and appropriateness. Some of them are about other issues like, um, should we consider infrastructure or school children or capacity of the town for um, various services? Um, and there are comments about what's really affordable, what's, section eight and so on. Um, so I think at this point, th the question I, I would love your feedback on is what makes a successful project um, for residents of affordable housing, for developers, for residents of Brookline as a whole, um, and where are the interests of those groups aligned and where do they conflict? Um, so I so think- Dylan, we'll, do you wanna start with one? Do you wanna start one of those groups first? Sure. Um, that's how I mean, you want to do it. What makes a, a project appropriate or inappropriate for a site? Is that what you're asking, Daphne, to break it down? Yeah, into he, has for, he has for different uh, different stakeholders. Right. right. People are going to write in the chat. We need to know which stakeholder group. So I was just thinking if you could start with one. Yeah. So let's start with what makes a successful project for residents of affordable housing. Uh, can I say something? Certainly. Um, for me, what makes a great place is the building itself. I mean, I have lots of requirements because I have severe allergies. I have vertigo and I'm going to be 56 years old. I like it quiet. I like that my neighbors like me and I like them. I resent having to choose noise inside my, my building, party inside or party outside. Uh, it's not cool. I absolutely hate it. Uh, the other thing that makes it, uh, besides the building and the people, that's most important. But I also love trees. Um, I love to garden. I love to share with the food rescue to, for all my neighbors. Um, <laughs> I'm like the, I'm like the Christmas person, you know, I drop them pineapples or chocolates and I know who likes what. I have excellent credit and the landlord doesn't seem to care because there's a few people that, you know, shouldn't be in housing and they're represented because they have mental illness or addiction and the disability law center uh, defends them, but they don't defend anyone who's slow. They don't defend anyone who's older. You know, um, I have, you know, different issues of that sort and I have excellent credit, but landlords don't, don't care. I've sent them letters. I've, I've had people call them for me. Um, and I just, I don't get anywhere. They just, they hate section eight. And I, I can understand that there's a bad group in this section eight, but I'm not one of them and I'm dragged down because of them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
for Thank that. you for that comment. There's no 55 and older housing in, in Brookline. Thank you. Thank you. Any other, anybody else sort of dying to speak here in, in addition to perhaps responding in the chat, which is going quite well, but um, you know, the chat's probably easier given the number of people in this meeting, but if you have something that you're just dying to say, maybe let us know. Lots of answers here. Um, Daphne, what, we should go back to. Yeah, so here. let's so, go back to residents of, what is what are some features residents of affordable housing? What would make for a successful project? Because we only had Karen's response to that. All right, so let's, I, I, so let's I think it's to reasonable that people are speaking people to that. people have said the, the people most appropriate to respond to that are the residents themselves. So right. move on to the next. So Dylan. We do have a hand raised um, from Chanda Jones Mercer. Hello. Um, good evening. I'm just, just basically want to say um, great, great slides, information. You guys are just fabulous. And I'm glad, I'm glad that you guys are doing this. This is just wonderful, getting feedback. And I'm, I just appreciate it. Um, basically, I, and you know, and one thing when it comes to uh, affordable housing, I just want to make sure, um, there's always say affordable housing, but is it really affordable housing? Um, and that's the tricky part. I mean, that word affordable doesn't mean affordable like it used to be back in the days. Um, so like me, I'm just flipping on when it comes to that, just the word itself. Mm -hmm. You know, so I want to make sure if this is affordable, this is going to actually be affordable. I mean, Brookline is very expensive. Everybody knows that. Um, and the majority of people, if you do have Section 8, it's very hard to have Section 8 in Brookline because a lot of people don't want a Section 8 Brookline because, you know, it's a certain amount of money they're limited to. So that's a problem. But um, other than that, I just wanted to share that. I think you guys did an excellent job tonight. I appreciate everything. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shonda. Thank, Thank you. you. There are a couple of comments um, in the chat that I just want to acknowledge a concern about losing commercial space for housing. And we've heard that before in some of the interviews, so it's coming up again tonight. And I just want to honor that comment. Uh, Dylan, did you want to uh, move on to another stakeholder? You're on mute, Dylan. Sorry, I muted That's myself okay. so I could type in the chat. Um, I'm a very loud typer. So the next question, you know, the next part of that question is what makes a successful mixed income or affordable housing project um, for developers? I think it, I think it makes sense. You can let's just ask all the stakeholders and just let us know which one you're referring to or right. all of them. So for developers, for residents of Brookline as a whole, for abutters, um, what makes the project successful for those groups? Developers, the town as a whole, abutters. I think the question about abutters is particularly interesting because that's, I think, mostly where the conflicts arise, I suppose. I mean, there's sort of the overall conflicts as people have noted in the chat about, you know, what are the impacts of housing uh, on services and expenses? But and on a specific level, I think all of us react very viscerally uh, to new, any kind of new development in our neighborhood. So the question is, what makes a successful new development? If you could imagine that in your neighborhood, you've seen a lot of examples tonight. What, what aspects of a, a development mm -hmm make it work for you, as you imagine that. Mm -hmm. 
That brought the chat to an end. <laughs> yeah, the chat was was going crazy while you were examples of what we mean. So provides the provides um, a maximum amount of affordable units, fits in according to the way you feel in terms of the scale, in terms of the style, in terms of the massing, in terms of providing green space, doesn't negatively impact small businesses. What, what are the things that would make it successful? So we have a comment that the questions are complicated and multi-layered and need thought. Um, I think I can answer some of them. My name is Karen. Hi, Karen. Um, oh. Hi. Uh, first of all, there's something called a SFMR, which means small area fair market rents. And there's a few of us that uh, fall into that category. And that means basically the landlord can get more for the nicer area. Um, I do have excellent credit. Um, and I just, I'm, I'm not seeing a lot of what I want to move into because we know landlords are greedy. We know that they're not paying top dollar for this land. Um, and I just, I also feel that there ought to be some other like uh, big businesses. It's great because big businesses pay more of the taxes. But um, on the other hand, you also have to be, because you're Brookline, you should be more concerned about the people because uh, I believe the, the money will just sort of flow if you have the communities still and uh, it's not overdeveloped like North Station. Great, great, some great buildings there, some nice um, real estate agents, but it's, it's chaos down there and I can't stand it. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. So we have some comments in the chat. Um, and I want to acknowledge uh, one is a successful development project reduces car dependence. Um, and we hear you folks that the questions are complicated. Uh, I think that you should probably take whatever thread in the question catches you and go ahead and respond to it. And don't worry about how complicated they are. Um, we have one that we're built out community. You're most likely talking about redevelopment. First part of the question is what are you tearing down? Uh, it is, is it an older, smaller housing that fits in a lower, you know, lower income niche, or are you demolishing existing small businesses? What about the embodied carbon in existing buildings? Um, I am saddened when places like Waldo Durkin are kept uh, only for upper classes and kept out of affordable units. As an abutter, I care about the impact on traffic, walkability, and retail. As a community member, I care about having a diverse community, about our children having exposure to a variety of peers. Um, could we minimize class warfare? Community benefits can be really helpful to neighbors to move a project forward. The future conversion of parking lots to park space on John Street connected. Walter Durkin is a great example. Community space, subsidized retail spaces for local businesses would be great. For a built out community, we sure have a lot of land devoted to parking lots. Um, I think different people choose different types of housing. We should be focused on creating a variety of housing types. Um, my neighborhood is constantly having new buildings. Smaller houses are torn down and built in its place, large McMansions. Um, what does aspects of design matter most? Maximizing the number of affordable units, a welcoming facade, especially at the street level, net zero design, good pedestrian biking infrastructure, building materials that are climate friendly and work well in the surrounding neighborhood, um, ideally shared outdoor space for residents, if not near a park. So Judy, that's a good segue to asking, if you were to think 10 to 20 years from now, what would Brookline look like in terms of successful affordable housing projects? What, what, what would you, what would it be 10 to 20 years from now when some of these projects will have been completed? What will make it successful? So I'm going to honor more of the chat. Just I'm not cutting off Daphne. It's just I think some no, people are already trying to. Chat while people are thinking about that. Yeah, no, and I appreciate that. I care about the scale, character, and design of any building or group of buildings and welcome affordable units in context. I think maximizing the number of units as well as making sure they are livable and big enough is really important. Um, variety of housing, maximizing the number of affordable units, including for families. 
mixed income, mixed use checks a lot of boxes. So I think we're getting to that sort of, what do you want Brookline to sort of be? Mm -hmm. uh, walkable density near transit with socioeconomic diversity and good design. Um, variety of those kinds of comments here. Dylan, did you want to follow up on any of those or, you know, um, what will Brookline be if our housing production is successful? We will have made reparations for redlining. Uh, involve, important to involve the surrounding community where it's being developed. When people of the community have the opportunity to ask questions, their input um, and maybe equal, uh, you know, to have, 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 make sure that their feelings are included. Um, like to see Brookline at least 20% affordable. Uh, there should be proportionately increased green space, school space, and other services. One question I have is um, we've heard a mix of opinions about whether design matters um, for, for those who, well, I guess for all of you, one question is we've looked, we, we showed you a couple of different examples which are in different, what I would describe as contexts. Um, what other contexts are there in Brookline and should we look at developing scenarios for those as well? So we showed you um, a, a corridor site on Boylston Street. We showed you something um, on Fisher Hill and we showed you something you know, just off of um, Harvard Street and, and on Babcock. Are there other contexts in Brookline and what matters in those contexts? Are they the same issues or different issues? So we would welcome any responses you may have to that question in the chat. I'm being very conscious of time. We promise people that we will close these meetings in two hours. And in fact, we're almost there. So I would say if you have anything to add to Dylan's question, if you could just put it in there and We'll try to summarize very quickly what's there so I can then turn everything back to uh, Roger. Um, but let's just see what's here. Um, beautiful buildings and everybody is treated equally. I think we should have more commercial development, more green and open space, good public realm to support well being, access to local businesses and healthy outdoor activity. Um, if abutters have veto for potential loss of daylight, noise, green space, um, we will be stopped. There should be larger community benefits, including more affordable housing with some limited but basic protections for abutters. Um, one of my visions is that all public housing units are safe and viable as decent housing for Brookline's Housing Authority residents. Lowering the red tape to building projects is important. Right now, only the biggest developers who can hire lawyers and consultants can add density. It's important to make it easier for folks to subdivide their homes or build smaller multifamily on small lots without years of hearings and lots of lawyers. Uh, vast improvements in public housing. Um, almost all of Brookline is within a half mile of public transit. So it seems that all of Brookline should allow multifamily housing as of right. Uh, agreed that improving quality of public housing in Brookline is, um, is a baseline. I would love a mother-in-law apartment. I'm quiet and have a porch to plant, porch to plants and share, excuse me, ports and plants to share with neighbors. Uh, a fair process. I assume that means like a fair permitting process. Um, maybe we should also discuss how we'll improve current public housing. I and think that breaks us. Pardon me, Dylan. There was one, there was a vision um, there that we're rid of the stigma surrounding public housing and affordable housing and we all see and accept or equalize. Right. So we're going to save this chat as we did last time um, and provide it to the town so that it can um, be made available on the housing production plan website. The slides for both parts of this presentation will be available on the town's housing production plan website. Uh, I think that if Roger would like to make any sort of closing remarks, uh, I would just like to say on behalf of the consulting team, we're really happy that we had so many participants tonight uh, and so many thoughtful comments and we appreciate and welcome and respect the differences of opinion. Roger. 
And and thank you, Judy, and thank you to your team, and uh, especially this evening, uh, uh, Dylan, for for leading uh, such a, a vibrant discussion, a uh, thoughtful discussion on the uh, the where and the what and the how, at least the beginning of, of, a, of a process uh, of engagement between so many people. And thanks mostly to all of you who, who joined tonight um, and so many uh, participating and, uh, and thinking about this. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's really impressive uh, in, in, in that respect. And you're, you've given um, the consulting team and, um, and uh, uh, Dylan and Peter and, and uh, the group uh, a lot to think about uh, it's the beginning of a process. It, this isn't a decision-making stage uh, by any means, but um, uh, I guess our greatest hope uh, to, to close things out tonight is that you've found it interesting and engaging and, and meaningful enough that you'll continue to, uh, to tune in and continue to, to voice your, your views and, um, and be energized by this process. It's got a ways to go. Thank you and good night. Thank you, Roger. And thank you, everyone. Good night.